Uh, let's begin with a prayer and then um, just actually do this real quick. Um, all of those who are on Zoom, I'm assuming you can uh, see my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Yes, Father. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, let's, uh, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory to amen. thee, O God. Glory to thee, O heavenly King. Comforter, the spirit of truth, who abides everywhere and fills all things. Treasury of blessings, giver of life, come and abide within us. Cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls, O good one. Amen. All right. Good to have everybody here. Welcome, welcome, Alex. Um, so today we're just kind of trucking along here. We're on part six now of uh, our, our intro to orthodoxy class. Um, a quick, super quick review of last week. Uh, last week we talked about sort of the church's understanding of salvation. Um, and we said, um, that's, let's see. there we go. Um, I, I like this passage. Why do we call Christ the Savior? Uh, likewise, we can also ask, what is salvation? Salvation from what? If we are talking about salvation, someone must be in danger, right? So that's sort of the starting point of how we understand salvation. We understand we have to understand that there has to be a problem. There has to be some crisis from which we need to be delivered, right? Um, Uh, from the beginning, the church's teaching has been that the nature of man was profoundly corrupted as a result of the fall. Adam and Eve sinned by violating God's order and breaking their connection with God, who alone is life. Uh, and this is a quote, but there's no end to the quote. The breaking of this communion with God can be consummated only in death because nothing created can continue indefinitely to exist of itself. And, you know, we said last week, too, that, you know, that really death was sort of the logical consequence of being disconnected from God, because it, it like, it, I use the image of like an iron, right? So as long as an iron is plugged in, you can turn it on, you can iron your clothes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but when you, but when you just, when you unplug it, the logical consequence is that it no longer functions. And for us, uh, when Adam and Eve, you know, decided they wanted to live sort of without God's commandments, uh, the logical consequence for them was 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 death, and and by extension, the logical consequence for us is death. Um, and then uh, original sin is understood by Orthodox theology as a so so kind of in comparison to Roman Catholicism, where there's more of a sense that original sin is sort of this stain that, that we share with Adam and Eve, almost like it, it is. I hate to say genetic, but almost as if it's in the DNA, right? Um, that's not the orthodox understanding. Original sin is understood by orthodox theology as a sinful inclination which has entered into mankind and become its spiritual disease, right? And when we said last time too, like that's why, you know, we talked about limbo, maybe it was a few weeks ago. How in, in Roman Catholicism, they have the teaching of limbo and limbo really is because of the Catholic understanding of original sin, they had to create limbo because they had to do something with babies that died who weren't baptized. Because if they weren't baptized, then they still had this sort of, again, this isn't how we understand it, but they had this sort of genetic stain of original sin. And so they had to go somewhere. So, and, and the same with uh, the Virgin Mary being immaculately conceived, right? That's Roman Catholic. And the reason the Roman Catholic Church has that is because of their understanding of original sin. So, because the Virgin Mary couldn't have had original sin, otherwise she couldn't have had Christ and been the mother of God. And so they have, there's all these kind of things that have to be created when you change the theology of the church. But that's not how we understand it. We understand it as sort of a, an inclination to sin. Um, in Orthodox- Father? Yes. Father? We yeah. So we have, so Father, so we have really no control over that. It just enters into us. We, yeah, that's how it is. Literally, and yeah, we have to deal with it. The air. It's just in the air. We just enter into it, you know. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's not like our, our personal fault, but it's something that we have to rectify in our life. Sure. It is, it is something that I think we would say it is something that has been rectified. Um, 
yes through, through christ right so through his right. his ministry it in some sense has been rectified um i think it, it is our job to sort of um take on ourselves what christ has already done does that make sense so that yes it does so that just um further um states that it is our choice absolutely yeah i mean the definitely choice is i mean we're free i would say <clears throat> and i think i think i said this last week is one of the most significant things god gave us is freedom right so we can we can choose to be with him we can choose to obey him or we can choose to do the opposite of those things so yes right okay all right all right thank um, you no problem thank you and orthodoxy salvation means not simply changing god's attitude right so that's there's kind of a protestant mindset i think where the, it's, it's as if god is angry with us and through christ's substitutionary sacrifice so he dies in our place that sort of placates the anger of god and now god isn't angry with us anymore that really isn't an orthodox understanding um so in orthodoxy salvation means not simply changing god's attitude but changing ourselves and being changed by god salvation ultimately means deification meaning the, the, to the degree we can to become like god to actually become as god is um and deification as we have seen uh entails transformation uh it is being united with god ever more fully through his grace his uncreated energy in which he is fully present right so it's through god's grace that we are transformed and and uh, with the goal the ultimate goal of becoming like god or at least um getting on the path that leads in that direction right um and then the other thing we talked about, we talked about salvation. Last week, we also talked about divine economy. Um, divine economy is the name given to the totality of miraculous events worked by God to make us once more his own, right? Sometimes they, the, the, so the word economy sort of means like all the things God did is what that means. So the economy of our God and Savior as it relates to man, says St. Basil, is the raising up of man from his fallen state and his return to kinship with God from alien, the alienation caused by his disobedience. So basically, God's economy sort of started when Adam and Eve got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And the goal of God's economy was, was to restore us to sonship with God, right? to, 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 to make us you know, citizens of the kingdom of heaven and heirs of God's kingdom. That was, that's the goal of divine economy. Um, so that's the end of the of last week's review. So today we're gonna we're really gonna talk about, um, in, in some sense. Well, maybe I, let me. I, I wanted to insert. So when we look at the church, and and in particular, I would say sort of like the church calendar. What I mean by the church calendar is like you know the date of Easter, and then Christmas is the twenty fifth of December, and the Dormition of the Virgin Mary is August fifteenth. Really, that whole annual cycle. It is sort of every year, it's as if we sort of repeat sort of the whole, I'm going back to what we, we said a minute ago, it's as if we're sort of reenacting or repeating or, or even more than that, I would even say, I would even say we are in some sense partaking of all of the events in the life of Christ that sort of happened so that we could be saved, right? So when we look at the calendar, really that's, that's in some sense the goal. And if you look at the calendar, there is a sort of a rhythm to it, right? I and mean, we have we have certain days when we fast. We have certain days when we feast. We have you know certain days like Great Lent. It's it's very different liturgically. We do services during Great Lent that we don't do any other time of the year, right? So there's kind of a flow, you know. And really, if you think about it, it's not unlike nature, right? Nature has a flow, right? I mean, in in the summer, things grow, right? It's warm. The days are long, right? Uh, in the fall, you know, the leaves change, right? And they fall from the trees, right? So there's a cycle even we know, you know, to the rhythm of the world. And I think the church, in some sense, when, when we look at the calendar, and we sort of partake of the calendar, right? To the degree that we come to the services and receive the sacraments and, and understand the gospel that's read for whatever feast day we're at, um, we, we, we take part in that. We are, we're sort of to use a cooking term, we're sort of steeped in that. You guys know what it means to be steeped? Steep means like you take something and you boil it and like you take the fruit and mm -hmm. you boil it, like I don't know, some alcohol or whatever. Like, 
big sign. Like tea. So were you going to say something, Helene? I just said like tea. Yeah, yes, yeah, perfect. All right, that's, a, that's the best example. Yeah, good job. So tea, we see tea, right? So the goal, in some sense, that's the liturgical life of the church. The goal is to sort of be steeped in the mind of the church. And that's how we sort of grow and mature. That's part of the whole theosis we talked about a minute ago. Our, uh, what do we call it? What was the word we used? Deification. It's, it's, they're all kind of the same words. They just come from different roots. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the calendar as it relates to the life of Christ. Um, so starting out with the incarnation of God, um, man's disobedience to the divine command created a gulf between him and his creator, right? So that's what the fall did. And this gulf was bridged by divine condescension, right? God, Jesus Christ comes down, right? He condescended, he became a man. Uh, when the second communion, uh, I'm sorry, this gulf was bridged by divine condescension when the second communion of man with God, so the first was in the Garden of Eden, right? And the second one was when Christ became a human, uh, took place. Had God not descended from heaven, and had man not approached the bosom of the Father, right? So that was when Christ ascended into heaven. So we were kind of, kind of pulling in a bunch of different feast days, sort of. So the one is that, that God came down, really, I, I would say the, the, the biggest day on that is the Annunciation, right? When, when Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary and said, you're going to conceive in your womb and you're going to bear a child and you'll name, you'll name him Jesus and he will save, you know, his people from their sins, right? So that was when God when God came down and became man. And at the ascension, and for those of you who don't know, the ascension is the day after Christ uh, died and he rose, 50 days later, no, 40 days later, he ascended into heaven, like bodily. He went physically up into heaven, right? So what he's saying here is that in the one place, God came down and became man. And in the other place, God took man, right, at the ascension, and literally brought humanity up into heaven physically, right? So, I mean, we, we believe that, that Christ is bodily in heaven. I mean, he has a body. So, I mean, someday, I guess we'll see him bodily because he is bodily now, um, even though he's the second person of the Trinity. Um, so, this is sort of, this is really just an order. So, chronologically, right, we have the Annunciation. That was the first event. That's why. The Archangel Gabriel comes and tells the Virgin she's going to have a baby, right? And Holy Spirit comes upon her and she conceives. Um, the nativity of our Lord, Christmas, which is 10 days from today. Uh, the circumcision of our Lord, which happened eight days after his birth. That was the Jewish custom. Um, the presentation into the temple. So that happened 40 days after he was born. So the tradition in the Jew Jewish practice was after a woman has a baby, after uh, 40 days after the birth, the, the woman goes and offers a sacrifice and presents the child and her, herself is, is sort of um, ceremonially cleansed, we, we could say, but we'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, the bat now, so now we, now we jump from his, his, when he's a baby to his life. So his first sort of adult event that we come across is being baptized in the Jordan, uh, his transfiguration on Mount Tabor, uh, the passion, right, when he was arrested and put in prison and the crown of thorns and he was whipped and beaten and then eventually uh the crucifixion is part of that and then the resurrection and then lastly well not, not lastly the ascension to heaven so he's bodily taken up into heaven and then the last thing is the sending of the holy spirit down on the church for the on the day of pentecost right so that's that we're going to talk about each of those now in turn the annunciation so the annunciation is sort of um in some sense, it's sort of a, shot, a foreshadowing of Pentecost, right? So Pentecost is, let me see if I can, I can see all crystal clear. So Pentecost is this day. So this is the day, at, 50 days after Christ died and rose again. Uh, 50 days later, uh, the Holy Spirit was sent down on the disciples in the form of tongues. And basically, this was the beginning of the church, so to speak. It's the beginning of when. They all went out and preached the gospel to all the nations. Um, and what we see is that in the Annunciation, we see this activity of the Holy Spirit. We see Gabriel comes to the Virgin Mary. I think I, love, I should actually see a better icon here. So, Annunciation. Uh, no, no, I don't. Shame on me. Anyway, so um, 
But what we see is that in both events, we see the activity of the Holy Spirit. So in the first event, in the Annunciation, the Holy Spirit comes down on the Virgin Mary, kind of uniquely, and within her womb, you know, forms uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Son of Man. Um, at the Annunciation, the Archangel says to the Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And then at Pentecost, we have the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? So both, both events are sort of Holy Spirit manifestations, we could say. The Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity who makes things happen, right? So in the case of the Annunciation, it was the Holy Spirit that went into the Virgin Mary's womb and, and conceived the, the baby Jesus. Uh, and in the case of Pentecost, it was the Holy Spirit that came down in the form of tongues of fire and, and sort of breathed life into the church, right? kind of began the church. Um, the Virgin Mary's, uh, this is, I think, an interesting, there's, some, there's kind of some interesting play here. So the Virgin Mary's obedience to the will of God at the Annunciation, where she says, behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, let it be unto me according to your word, counters Eve's disobedience in the Garden of Eden, right? So the fathers of the church, when they look at this event, they see Mary, uh, the Virgin Mary is sort of the, the anti-Eve almost, right? So where, where Eve disobeyed, uh, Mary obeys. Where, where Eve does what she wants, the Virgin Mary does what God wants. Um, and Jesus Christ is sometimes referred to as the new Adam. Right? So again, one of the images that the fathers use is, you know, basically Adam and Eve were given a fasting rule in the Garden of Eden, right? They were told not to eat a certain fruit. So another term for that is fasting, right? So the, the first thing Adam and Eve do is they break a fast, right? And the first thing Christ does after he's baptized is he goes into the wilderness for 40 days to fast, right? So we see sort of like where, where, where Adam screwed up, Christ sort of fixed it. Where Eve was disobedient, the Virgin Mary is obedient, right? So the fathers of the church kind of give us those two kind of Com contradicting points or whatever you want to call them. Um, the Virgin Mary serves as the locus for the incarnation. So she's the point, the point at which it happens. Um, for the Son and Word of God to take on flesh, a locus was needed where the union of divine and human natures could be forged. That place was the most holy and all pure Virgin Mary. Um, so that's, that's the Annunciation, right? So that's the first event. That's Christ's sort of first becoming, taking on flesh, right, in the womb of the Virgin. And then we fast forward. So the Nativity, it's worth knowing too, uh, is celebrated exactly nine months after the Annunciation, right? So um, on March 25 is the Annunciation. On December 25, nine months later, is the birth of Christ. Well, any? Um, what human eye did they see Christ? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've never read one way or the other. I, you know what I think? I'm going to guess that they died before the Annunciation. I'm not sure. I have read their life, like the life of uh, Yoki Manna, but I, I don't remember what, what it said about their, you know, how, when, at what point they died. Obviously, they, you know, they took her to the temple. She was three or four when that happened. But I don't know. I don't know. I could probably find out if I remember. I'll, I'll look it up. That's a good question. Um, the birth of Christ. So the nativity of Christ is a theophany, which means a theophany means God's God appears. God appears. Um, that is to say, a divine manifestation of God to the world. God appeared in the flesh. One Timothy three. This means that God, the Word, took upon Himself the human body and was revealed to the world as theanthropos. Theanthropos is, uh, means, it's two words, theos, God, God, and anthropos is man. So man. sometimes the fathers will say, we use this word theanthropos to mean that he was both fully God and fully man. Did someone on Zoom have something? I heard a voice. I said what you said. I'm sorry, Father. Okay, yeah. I was talking out loud. I reiterated. <laughs> theanthropos means God man basically is what it means. This manifestation of God to the world is the beginning of our entrance into the world of God, right? So it's interesting. So God, we, we gain entry into the, to God's world because God took the initiative and entered into our world. 
Um, St. Gregory, the theologian, writes, he who is not carnal, meaning God, right, doesn't have flesh, he who is not carnal becomes incarnate. The invisible becomes visible. The Son of God becomes the Son of Man. Uh, and he who gives riches to others becomes poor, assuming the property of my flesh, so that I may assume the richness of his divinity. Right? So God, you know, God became man, as St. Athanasio says. God became man so that man could become God with a small team. Um, uh, in reality, Christ descended even into Hades, while man merely reached out his hand toward him in order to receive the new life. So you see in this icon, you see this is a uh, holy Saturday, the descent into Hades, where Christ goes down and he pulls Adam and Eve up out of, out of Hades. And of course, and it's interesting, too, if you look in the icon, typically, if you look closely at this icon, typically, um, this is Adam. I mean, he sort of represents all of humanity. Um, but he's not, Adam isn't even holding on to Christ. Christ is holding him by the wrist, right? Which shows how much, how little is done by man, right? So it's not as if they're doing this. They're like doing this, right? So God is really, you know, taking the initiative in every way, right? So it's kind of a powerful little, it's a little thing, but it, it points to something bigger. Uh, the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of man, that is, of Adam, might become sons of God. So it's, we've said that before. Um, any questions? Anyone? Anyone on Zoom have any questions? So I can see who's on Zoom. Any, any questions from the, uh, the Zoom uh, folk? Yes, no, maybe so. All right, we'll keep going then. Um, yeah, shoot. So... Aside from Adam and Eve, did uh, any others come with them from Christ at that moment? Well, I think I, I, all of them. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think anyone who, so I mean, I think the, the teaching of the church, so that event is commemorated on Holy Saturday. So really that icon, sometimes we think of that icon as uh, like the resurrection icon. It really isn't the resurrection icon. The resurrection icon is, I'm trying to find the wall. <laughs> yeah, it's right here. Um, so, so yeah, even even the way this is actually not even it's not even right on the icon. So this is really the resurrection icon, right? So the, it's the empty tomb, right? So the, obviously the tomb being empty was the proof of the resurrection, right? So this this icon is the is the, is the is really the. Uh, on Pascha Day, this is the icon we have out, typically. Um, we usually have this one out, too, and I, it's not really wrong to do so. But this icon, it, it says Anastasi, which means resurrection. That's actually not entirely right. It really should say, I'll let Zoom people see here, too. It really should say, descent into Hades. Because this icon is a depiction of Christ on Holy Saturday going down into Hades and sort of liberating, all, uh, preaching the, the good news. Because it really, even going back further, the teaching of the church is that when John was John the Baptist was beheaded, he he was not only the forerunner in this world, but he also was the forerunner in Hades. So was, when he was when he was killed, he went into Hades and he sort of preached. He basically preached that the Messiah was going to be coming there as well. So he was the forerunner in this world, but also in Hades. And then when Christ came into Hades, when he descended into Hades, um, he preached the gospel there, and whoever accepted it was taken up with him. Right. So we don't. Did. We don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't have the attendance sheet. Father. No. Yes, Eleni. That was yeah. the first time I've ever heard that uh, John the Baptist actually went down to Hades. I've never heard that before. Well, That's actually, interesting. I, I believe it's even in one of the letters. It's in one. Really? Of the, yeah, I'd have to look. I, I can see if I can look, but yeah, no. That, that's wow. But it makes sense because where would he have gone? I mean, everybody went to Hades. So, I mean, that, I mean, that would have been the only option. And, you know, he was the forerunner. So he was probably, you know, I mean, the teaching of the church is that he, he sort of was the forerunner there as well. He was the, he sort of said, hey, the Messiah is going to be coming here next. Interesting. Yeah, that's my, that's what I know. I mean, hopefully it's correct. Um, all right. So any other comments? Yeah, uh, Tony. Uh, 
Now, of course, he says that Christ was with God from the very beginning. Yeah. The Trinity is eternal. You sure? Always together. <laughs> Correct. So, did Christ have a body form before? No. No. I mean, he was just, yeah, no. I mean, we would say that he did not become, he did not take on any form. Until he became, you know, until he became incarnate in the virgin's womb. Well, once he took on a bodily form in this world, he maintains some type of bodily form now in heaven. He ascended bodily into heaven, so he still has that body. And that's the teaching of the church. So there is a, you know, Christ is bodily in heaven. What that means exactly, you know, I mean, we don't, obviously many things regarding God, we don't really understand fully. Um, but that's the teaching of the church is that he, which really is a, is a great thing because that means that in some sense, humanity, because he represents all of us, right? So humanity has been taken up on the right? And so we can expect. So did his nature somehow change once he came into this world? Well, I, I mean, I, we would say no. I mean, I think that like, the, uh, that, I think of like, I, I can't quote it, but there's a creed they wrote at one of the councils in Chalcedon. And, and we would, he wasn't changed. I mean, they're very emphatically saying he didn't change. I mean, he was still, I mean, obviously he took on a body. So in that sense, he didn't have a body. So there was that, obviously, we could say. But, um, but he was still, you know, he was still as much the second person of the Trinity as he had been prior. But there's always that struggle between the nature of Christ, man, Spirit, and I think that then, you know, well, and again, I think the teaching of the church is that he's fully God and fully man. You know, he's he is the he is in, he is the entirety of the second person of the Trinity. Yeah, we correct. Yeah, he was not correct until you know until you know the archangel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary and said, "You're going to conceive." There was no. Yeah, he was he was not material, which actually I mean that, that makes me think even like iconography, like one of the one of the issues with iconography, <laughs> you know, in, in the Ten Commandments, right? Moses said you will have no graven images, right? And so Protestants and Muslims and Jews don't have images. If you go to a mosque, it's all just whitewashed walls, right? What what we would say is that, and and they might even say, well, look at you guys, you're worshiping, you know, images, you're pagans or whatever, right? But what we would say is that prior to Christ's becoming a man, it was correct that you could not depict God, right? Because he had been he had taken on a depictable form, right? But when he became man, now he's depictable, right? And we would even say that to, to say that you can't depict him actually is problematic because that would mean that he's somehow not human the way I am. Because you can depict me. Nobody has a problem with that. So if I can depict me and I can't depict him, then he must not be human the way I am. Just like that one icon you showed us uh, a few weeks ago, like in the Garden of Eden, where Christ, uh, he's representing God. Uh, I, I don't recall which icon. Was he the one like creating? Why is Christ in this icon? Oh, yeah. It's supposed to represent, well, God is. Christ is God. Correct. And of course. Human beings, the only vision that we have of God is Christ. That's it. They're the same. Right? But they are, exactly. Christ, Christ is God. He, he is, correct. I mean, we don't we don't have an image of the Father. We don't have an image of the Holy Spirit, but we see we see the entirety of God in Christ, we would say. Sometimes you see like the white house above representing. <laughs> correct, correct. Like in, in the baptism icon, you'll see that. That's true. Any other questions on Zoom? Anybody? All right. Um, so now we move to the circumcision and naming, which happened uh, in the Jewish tradition. They both happened in the same event. Um, this was part of the Jewish law. Uh, quote, and on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised from Leviticus. Uh, Jesus was obedient to the law. This event is celebrated eight days after Jesus' birth, January 1. Um, oops. Um, why did Jesus submit to be circumcised? Um, firstly, um, in order to not be considered a transgressor of the law. Right? So the law said that any faithful Jew 
a Jewish son had to be circumcised, so he was obedient to that. He was a faithful Jew, and he didn't want to transgress the law. Secondly, so that his incarnation for our salvation would not be considered a work of fantasy. And what he means by that is that the fact that he had skin, it was cut, and it was blood, right? And it could be blood. That was proof that he wasn't a ghost, but he was a human, right? Uh, thirdly, in order to school us in humility and obedience, right? Because he was humble and he was obedient to the law. And fourthly, so that we might also learn to excise from our hearts recollections fueled by the passions. That is the true and holy circumcision. So that's a little bit more allegorical. What he's saying is that sort of in the same way that Christ had this flesh cut off of him, we are called to sort of cut off the passions from our own lives. So he, he did this in, as a sort of a symbolic forerunner in, in, in that. And, and we are supposed to follow. He, he had the foreskin cut off. And we are supposed to cut off the passions and die to our, our, our fallen self. Um, um, circumcision and naming. Oh, okay. So now we move on to the presentation in the temple, which happened... Uh, 40 days after the birth. So he, he, we have the Annunciation, when he was conceived, the birth, the circumcision, and then the Annunciation. Um, and this is a quote from Leviticus talking about the significance of this event. Yeah, Lenny. How do we make sense out of the word Annunciation? Well, I think that, I, I, so the question was, well, how do we make sense of circumcision? Why did we stop doing it? That's not your question, yeah. Um, I think what the fathers would say, is that the circumcision was sort of like um, a training for what was to come. And, I, and clearly, and St. Paul says this very clearly in his writings, that the true circumcision is, that the fullness of circumcision is baptism. So, so we don't have circumcision anymore because Christ came and was baptized and sort of completed everything. And now we, now that we have everything, because we have everything except for the, the final you know, consummation of all things, um, the, that that circumcision, which was really just a type of baptism almost, is done away with if we don't use it anymore because now we have baptism. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I think that's what we would say. Definitely, Paul. Father, Father, yes. I have a question. Yeah, Helena. so regarding the, I'm sorry. So regarding the circumcision, so Jesus was born December 25th, and the circumcision is in early January, as well as the baptism. So, like, the yep. circumcision was done as he was a baby correct yeah yeah so the the practice the jewish practice was uh eight days after birth uh they the child was circumcised and given his name and we celebrate even though Sunday. like even though later on way later on 30 years later or whatever he was baptized correct yeah i think um, okay okay is there a question there? Or are you just kind of observing? Well, I was just thinking, I mean, like, you know, in terms of today, there's circumcision, you know, in the hospital or whatever. And then there's baptism, like right soon after that. And we know that Christ was baptized in his 30s with yes. St. John the Baptist. And so it was like kind of like unclear because as we're talking, it's like almost since the baptism and the circumcision is are somewhat you know, close in dates as Christmas, yeah. it's kind of like, I'm not too sure. Is like, when did that all take place? Yes, yeah, so this, yeah, the circumcision was eight days after, and, and really that falls on January 1st. So January 1st is, is the feast day of St. Basil the Great, and it's also the feast day of the circumcision. And then um, the 40 days is, what is, uh, geez, what is it, February, Sixth is uh, yeah yeah February sixth is is the and uh, that's is the presentation, and the presentation had a different function. So let me read Leviticus real quick. When the days of her purification, so this is uh, Moses talking to the Jews, sort of explaining to them what this is. When the days of uh, her purification, meaning the mother, whoever the mother is, when the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for a burnt offering, and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. Uh, he shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her, and then she will be ceremonially clean from her flow of blood. But if she cannot afford a lamb, she has to bring two doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her, and she will be 
So the, the story behind that are sort of two things. One, well, really, let just focus on the one. Um, the, the flow of blood that the woman had was something that was considered to be unclean, right? So because after, you know, as you probably know, after a woman has a baby, typically she's bleeding for, you know, some six weeks, 40 days, whatever it is. After that, it, it stops and then, you know, everything's sort of back to normal. Um, so, so that bleeding was considered to be ceremonially unclean. I don't want to get into that too much because, to be honest, I don't know that I could give you a really good explanation. Um, but in order to sort of be officially sort of pronounced clean, she would go to the temple and offer, you know, this offering. And it, what's also interesting, too, on a side note, is uh, theoretically, there were two options, right? There's two options in the offering. You could either offer a lamb and a dove, right, or a pigeon. So that you could either offer a, a lamb, and then the other offering would be either a pigeon or a dove, right? And that was basically the rich, the rich people would offer, or at least upper middle income, right, whatever. Or for the poor, there was, you know, the, the temple kind of condescended and basically said, well, if you can't afford that, you can just bring two doves or two young pigeons, right? Now, do you guys know which, what, what did Joseph and Mary bring to the temple? Do you know which, which of those offerings? Did they bring a lamb and the dove or did they bring, what did they bring? Yeah, which tells us what about their economic status? Yeah. So Jesus really was born. I mean, if, if Joseph and Mary, I mean, Joseph was a carpenter, right? He wasn't, you know, presumably, a, you know, a high roller. Um, but I think it's interesting. So, and this here witnesses to the fact that Christ was born into really like simple means. Like he was probably, I mean, maybe not poverty, but not wealth by any stretch, right? So that, that, that's just an interesting little, little side note, I think, for me. Um, St. Luke the Evangelist recounts that when the time came for the purification of Christ's parents, what we just talked about, um, according to the flesh, in compliance with the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem, Christ, to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male child that opens the womb shall be designated as holy to the Lord. So there really were two things happening here. There was the offering for Mary, right? So she could be ceremonially clean and she could come into the temple. Because if, if you had a flow of blood, like a woman like, who had just had a baby, you weren't allowed to go into the temple. You really couldn't even like interact with people because you were considered unclean. And if they interacted with you, they would become unclean. Um, so that was number one. But also, <clears throat> the firstborn son uh, of a couple, for lack of a better way of putting it, the way I've heard it, which I think is interesting, the firstborn son is basically owned by God, right? And so in order to redeem that son and sort of buy that son back from God, for lack of a better way of putting it, there was an offering that was given. So when, when people would have uh, their first son, they would have to go to the temple and make an offering to sort of redeem, that's the term they used, which really means just to buy back, right? To redeem that child, right? So this is what was happening as well in this, in this event. Um, so now we jump forward to uh, the baptism. Any questions or comments? Anyone, Janice? Yeah. I just have a question. Shoot. Because... You know, I'm still going back to like old school. Yeah. Is it still, still considered, I'm thinking of my children. Yeah. Unclean, if, a, you know, to um, to accept the holy sacraments during your time of the month. When you're having a period. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the canons of the church. So there, there's a sort of a, a large body of writing that is uh, sort of the church uh, through, you know, hundreds of years. All these canons, they're called canons, but they're kind of guidelines, I guess is a good way to phrase it, were compiled. And one of the, well, there is a canon or maybe multiple that talk about sort of not receiving when you're having your period, right? Um, so I, I will tell you myself, I mean, I, I, I kind of am in the middle. Like I, I have women that come to me and, and don't feel comfortable receiving when they're having their period. And I, and I think if they don't feel comfortable, then they probably, it's fine, they should um, but I don't, I don't personally have a real problem with it because I, I think part of it too is that, and another priest actually made this observation, and I thought it was a good observation, is that, you know, back then they, they had a much simpler, it sounds bad, but they had a much simpler sense of science. Like we, we understand that like when you eat something, it doesn't go right in your blood, it goes in your stomach and it's slowly absorbed. So I think there was a concern 
that if you had communion and then you, that it would immediately like sort of exit your body because you're having a period, right? But we kind of know that isn't the case. Um, and so I, I'm kind of in the middle of that, if that answers your question. Yeah, I I mean, that, there definitely you. is, there are, you know, canons that talk about that and prohibit it. Um, we were but, raised that way. Yeah, young. That, that's not uncommon. I mean, you know, I have a lot of people that, that have that. I was kind of talking with Christy Karen. She said, kind of. My wife? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we were saying, you know. But the best thing to do is to talk to your priest. And yeah. Usually in confession, is usually one-on-one -on -one at least is the best. Because some of these things, it's it's because you it, don't it's like the children. Contextual. The grandchildren, and the yeah, children, they don't understand the girls. They they probably would. Yeah, that would be even more. Because I still we we'll go back to when we were kids. Yeah, it's a different era. Yeah. Yes. So I don't. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, all right. Anyone else? Oh, yeah, Tony. Ever since I was a little boy, maybe this is an old wives' tale. Ever since I was a year old. That when, I, when you come for communion, my parents said, you know, make sure you don't cut yourself. Uh, That's along the same lines. Yeah, exactly. That's, so, and again, I, I. We have to wait like six hours, make sure you don't be like six hours. Yeah, before. yeah. I, again, I, I kind of am in the middle on that. Like, I understand that, and I, I, I want to I wanna honor that because I think it, it, there is, that is part of the thinking of the church. Um, but I also think that, again, I mean, when I receive communion, it doesn't instantly go into my blood. If I were to cut myself, it's not like it would then be coming out of that. Does that make sense? Well, that's true. Or even like, like, even like chewing gum. We should be chewing gum, of course. Um, or even sucking on a, you know, pacifier or a lollipop. Yeah, or spitting, God forbid. Yeah, so that's all of those things. Those I would say yes. I, I would I emphatically agree with those. I you know I usually I would say more like eat a meat. Like if you've eaten some food, I think at that point you're you know, which is part of the reason why we give out the antidote, right? Because it kind of kind of washes it down, for lack of a better way of putting it. Actually, in the Russian practice, they often will have because they're still Russian Orthodox Church. Oftentimes, after you receive communion, they'll have a little table off to the side with wine and water. And you'll go and you can drink a little wine and a little water and sort of wash it down, which I think is, you know, makes sense. So. I've done a little time, uh, I frequently have most weeks. So I'm going back over my, you know, uh, they call it communion. All of a sudden I get a most week, like within a half hour. Yeah, I mean, again, that, like if that were to happen, I mean, I, I just have no choice but to receive. If that were to happen to me, what I would probably do is I would probably, I mean, obviously you don't know that's gonna happen. It's not like a premeditated yeah. thing. What I would do is I'd probably just, you know, do my best to stop it and then whatever, uh, I mean, I, I, again, I find myself sort of in the middle. I would probably take, you know, the Kleenex that, that had the blood on it and I'd probably burn it, but just to be safe, you know? So you don't wanna be, you don't wanna be radically legalistic. I don't think that's good. I don't think Christ came for that. But you also have to honor it, right? You don't want to not honor it. So you kind of, I think you got to be somewhere in the middle of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anyone uh, on the Zoom? Any questions? All right. Uh, just that I agree with all that, but it's it it's really for our soul, isn't it, Father? What's the it? Oh, the receiving. So what 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 direction would that? The take? receiving of the receiving of communion. And the blood, um, yes, it enters our body, but it truly is for our soul. Well, it's, it's, it's physical and spiritual. I mean, it is a physical thing, right? Right. But it's also spiritual. So, yes, I mean, yeah. So does that, are you, are you arguing that we should not worry about having our period? I mean, I guess I'm trying to follow your line of reasoning. No, it's not a period thing. It's just that like when we pray before we have in communion, I don't think we, we as parishioners, or at least myself, don't really think of the body as much, but I really think of my, my soul and its destination because of me receiving communion and my proper method of coming forth. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say both and. To that. I mean, I, okay. I, I think everything, I mean, you know, I, I think we, we want to honor it. 
you know, it, it, we certainly should prepare, we should fast, we should pray, we should, you know, go to confession periodically. So all that is true. Um, but I also think, I mean, at least at some point in the history of the church, there was a thinking that, you know, a woman having a period or someone getting cut is problematic in relation to receiving communion. Now, right. ha have, have, I mean, science has advanced a little bit. You know, we don't want to diminish the, the saints, though. So, you know, that's kind of my, I don't know. I don't know that I have a really good answer. We could talk about this all night. Well, it's well, just yeah. that you would feel like, like at Easter, yeah. especially when it's so huge. Yeah. You'd all be dressed up in your new clothes yeah. on Saturday. Yeah. And sure. To get I, I, again, and then I, you'd I stand there. And my, not be well, able. Yeah, I'll tell you what I would say to this. Is if that's an issue with anyone, I would tell them that they should come and talk to me one-on-one -on -one in my office, just the two of us. Yeah. Because everybody's different. And, you know, it's just like a doctor. I mean, really, the spiritual life, it, the spiritual life, like the relationship of a doctor to a patient is a lot like the relationship of a, a, a parishioner to the, their spiritual father, the priest, whatever, because everybody's different. And, you know, someone might not be able to fast, you know, strictly. Maybe they can only not have meat. Or, so, I mean, you got to look at everybody in their own context and you can't just apply one rule to everybody, you know, as, as the saying goes, one size does not fit all. Right? <laughs> so any other comments on Zoom or here? All right. Um, go back here. Well, actually, I'm going to do this real quick. So uh, the baptism of Christ, continuing on our path here. Um, through his baptism, the Lord initiated the practice of baptism in the church. And by descending into the waters of the Jordan and ascending from them, he prefigured his death and resurrection. That is why through our own baptism, we also participate in a sacramental manner in his passion and resurrection. So, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the saying I, I like best on this is that I heard, I don't know who said it, but they, they refer to the baptismal font, right? The, you know, the tub where we get baptized. They, they refer to it as the, the tomb and the womb, the tomb and the womb, right? So it's the tomb in which we participate in Christ's death. Right, and it's the womb out of which we participate in Christ's resurrection. Right? So that's kind of the teaching of the church in kind of a catchy, simple way. And then this is um, this is actually the God, the epistle reading, Romans uh, six three to five. This is part of the epistle reading that's read at the baptismal service. So this is really, in some sense, this is how we understand baptism. And this is what it says. It says. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Right. So that's the teaching of the church is that in, the, in, the, in that we participate in his death, we will also participate in his resurrection. So that, and, and, and to go back to what you had said, Eleni, this, this is what circumcision was pointing to. It was a, it was a type or an image or a prefigurement of, of this. So where, where circumcision was sort of the mark of the Jew, uh, baptism is the mark of the Christian. Right? So that's, that's what's happened. That's kind of what, that's the evolution, we could say. Um, oops. Um, there we go. At Christ's baptism, uh, the heavens were open. So, uh, you know, the, the, I'll look at this, this icon here on the screen. So we see Christ, right? we see John the Baptist, we see sort of these characters that are sort of going away from Christ, um, symbolizing sort of the, 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 the Jordan was, was sort of itself. The, these are sort of personifications of the Jordan River, right? So that when, when Christ stepped in, it was as if the Jordan River like stepped back in awe of, of God. Uh, we see the, the dove here, which somebody I think Tony had mentioned earlier, right? Symbolizing that the Holy Spirit, you know, had coming upon him. And then you can't depict it in an icon, but of course, traditionally, uh, you know, the, the gospels say that the Lord, uh, the God, the Father spoke and said, you know, this is my, you know, beloved son in whom I am well pleased, listen to him, or I forget if, 
He said that one of them at the Transfiguration. Anyway, so so we have this we have this sort of Trinitarian revelation, right? So we have we have God the Father speaking, we have God the Son being baptized, and we have God the Holy Spirit descending in the form of a dove. So the church sort of looks at this event as the first revealing, the first time the Trinity was revealed to mankind. Um, so at Christ's baptism, the heavens were open to him and the Holy Spirit came down uh, and descended and alighted upon him. So it sort of sat on him. Likewise, at our baptism, the heavens open and Christ sends the Holy Spirit who calls us to the heavenly home. And he does not simply call us, but calls us with the greatest honor. For he has not made us angels and archangels, which would be less than what we are, but he has caused us to become sons of God. So we're not, we're not just workers in the kingdom of heaven like the angels are. We are literally heirs of the kingdom. We are sons of God. Right? Um, so now we move on. So that was the, the baptism. And now we move on to the transfiguration. So you see the icon here again. I'm sure you know the event. Uh, Christ takes... Uh, Peter, James, and John up Mount Tabor, and then all of a sudden he's, you know, become so bright they can't look at him, and then these two characters appear, Moses and uh, Elijah, uh, sort of talking to him about, <clears throat> it says in the gospel, about his exodus, and that's a reference to basically his crucifixion, right? Um, and then, of course, Peter and James and John are, are like overwhelmed, they can't even look, they're, they're falling back, so this is sort of a depiction of that event. Um, so the word transfiguration means to take on a different form, right? Christ, however, so this actually isn't, to call this the transfiguration isn't exactly precisely right. Um, Christ, however, was not transfigured by assuming a different form, but by revealing to his disciples, oh, that was weird. Um, let me make sure everybody's still there. Sorry about that. Did that just blink or am I like losing my mind? Does everybody still see uh, my screen? Is that a yes? Okay. Uh, can you see uh, the Holy Transfiguration? Anybody on Zoom? Yes. Okay. Um, so Christ, however, was not transfigured by assuming a different form, but by revealing to his three disciples what he truly was. So it wasn't, it wasn't as if he was transfigured. What happened was he had been sort of veiling who he truly was. And when he went up Mount Tabor, all of a sudden he sort of lifted the veil just for a minute to let them see his divinity, right? So that's what happens here. Uh, a hymn sung on the Feast of the Transfiguration says, <clears throat> come, let us ascend into the mountain of the Lord and behold the glory of his transfiguration, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So that's what happened on this feast day. That's what we celebrate. Christ opened the spiritual eyes of the three disciples who accompanied him up the mountain and showed them the glory of his face, that is, the glory of his heavenly kingdom. So that's what's commemorated on this day, that event. Um, the Holy Transfiguration was a further manifestation of the triune God, meaning the Trinity. The voice of the Father, so just like at the baptism, where I said the baptism, the, the, the Father spoke and the Holy the Spirit descended as a dove and, and Christ was being baptized. You also have sort of a Trinitarian appearance at this event. Uh, the voice of the Father coming out of the cloud, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So the, the voice was the Father, the cloud was the Holy Spirit, uh, bore witness to Christ saying, this is the Father, saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And by concluding with the words, listen to him, God made clear that whoever obeys the commandments of Christ, give, uh, given the commandments of Christ given for man's salvation shall be counted worthy of contemplating the glory of his kingdom, right? So the other point here again is that there is this sort of Trinitarian revelation again. We have it at the baptism and we have it again at, at this event, at the transfiguration. Um, and then the passion of our Lord. Hold on one sec. I just want to see. All right, we got, we'll get a few more slides up here. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've always liked the icons of, of the passion. So this, can anyone tell me what this icon is? It should be easy. What's this icon of the picture? What do you think? Mm. Anyone on Zoom know what this icon is? 
It's kind of it's kind of a neat. I I, I don't know. I just really like. It. So it's Christ, right? And then we see would a that be Christ? Would that wash his hands? Who washed his hands? Pontius Pilate, right? Pilate. Correct. So here, this is a depiction of of Pilate, right? After he had been right after the Jews basically said crucify him. Pilate says, you know, I find nothing wrong with him, you know, and then he washes his hands and he says, I am innocent of this man's blood. Um, so that's just a depiction of that. Event. I, I, I don't know. I always find these icons kind of neat. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. You're right. <laughs> that's something I've never thought about. I mean, I've, I realize that, but I've never really given any thought. I just thought of that. Yeah. And part of me uh, thinks yeah. because historically he's, he was known, so it verifies. Yes, I do think so. Just for the Zoom folk, uh, Janet was saying that the, the only person mentioned by name in the creed, I guess, other than the Virgin Mary, um, is Pontius Pilate. And I think the reason, and I think you're right, I had the same thought as you were progressing. I think the reason for that is that it, 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 it puts Christ at a point in history because. Pontius Pilate was a known historical figure. So by doing that, sort of, we know it, it kind of validates, uh, for lack of a better word, sort of the story, so to speak. So is that kind of what you would say? And when I was reading up on that a little bit too, it's interesting. He was in his position for 11 years, but he was a bad leader. Okay. And what's interesting, his name got in but he was the worst of all leaders. Oh, really? Yeah, the weakest and the worst. Oh, really? So he just was not, yeah, he was not an effective was, governor. And most of them were promoted after a year, two years. He was 11 years in his position. Oh, man, so he was kind of an excuse stuck. You're right. Because he wasn't doing a good yes. job. He never got promoted. He never. Okay, well, that's it. that's kind of interesting. That is, that is. Actually, you know what? I'm going to stop it because I, I like to stop at eight just to honor that. Um, are there any closing no. questions, comments, observations? Anybody on Zoom? Anybody here? Anybody? Anyone on Zoom have any questions? All right, I'll take that as a no. All right, well, let's close with a prayer. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ our God, we thank you for gathering us together this evening. We uh, ask you to uh, enlighten our minds and our hearts to know and do your will in the world we live in um, and to help us carry uh, your your gospel uh, out into the world. For you are holy now and ever into the ages and ages. Amen. All right.